Section 2.3 Limit Laws In this section, section 2.3, uh, we are going to learn about the limit laws and how to apply them. It's a long section, but we'll see how far we can go with it. We suppose that the limits of two functions, f of x and g of x, as x approaches a, both exist and c is a constant, it's a number. Then <clears throat> the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. Limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. As you guys can see, sum of the difference, uh, sorry, the limit of the difference is the difference of the limits, means you can pass the limit of the first function minus the limit of the second function. Limit of the product is the product of the limits, and limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limits, provided that the limit of the denominator is not zero. Okay, uh, make sure you write that down. Number five, the limit of a constant times the function, it says you can take out the constant to the front. Next one, the limit of any constant is the constant itself. And I showed it here graphically. So now we're going to look at an example here, simple example, how to apply the limit laws, the six of them that I just presented. We still have more. But for the meantime, we're going to go over uh, those six for now. And I'll show you later on the other ones. So the limit of x plus 11 as x approaches 2. Do not just go ahead and plug in 2 plus 11 because it's not a, an exact value here. So what do we do instead? We apply the first property which says <clears throat> the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. Now for the first one, that's a straight line y equals x. As x approaches 2 from both sides, the y value goes to 2. So you got a 2, and the limit of the constant by property 6 is still itself 11. And that gives us 13. So when you start working on homework from the bulk, you should show steps like this. Only for this section, but later on, for subsequent sections, you can, you know, kind of skip steps. But for this section, we do need to use it. There's another one here. We need to find the limit of 5x minus 7 as x approaches negative 3. 
as x approaches negative 3. To do so, we do the limit of the difference is the difference of the limits. That's by property 2. If you look at the first one, the 5x, by property 5, you can take the 5 outside by property 5. Then it's 5 times negative 3 minus 7. Which is negative 15 minus 7. And that gives us negative 22. Now we have more laws for exponents or properties. This is the power law it says, if you are passing the limit of function that is being raised to an exponent, it's the same as if you pass the limit inside to the nth power. You must take the five out. For this section, all the steps need to be applied. Otherwise, why are we teaching you that law or that property? For what? You need to apply it, right? The next one called root law is that it allows you to move the limit inside regardless of the index. If it's square root, cubic root, fourth root, all the same. There's a, an example here. You want to try it first so for this one we pass the limit of each one of them like so and I rewrote x squared as a whole x being squared then I can pass the limit inside by the power law that quantity inside the parentheses being squared is simply 2 squared and the middle one is simply 2, and the constant stays the same as 7. And then becomes an arithmetic operation, which is 9. Next one. Try this one step by step. So here we have a quotient. So the limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limits. And then we take the top one by itself by passing the limit for each one of them. And same thing for the denominator. I know this looks very tedious, but it's required. Then we pass the limit inside for each one of them and pull the constants out like the two on the top and three in the denominator and then evaluate it. Got negative 1 over 14. Next one, the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x squared plus 1 minus 1.
this one I see a difference so the limit of the difference is the difference of the limits like so Then we can pass the limit inside the radical sign. Then you do the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. Then it pass the limit inside the x square, keep everything else the same, evaluate, we got zero. Keep in mind while you're working with limits. Sometimes when you evaluate, you get one of these two things, either zero over zero or infinity minus infinity. Zero over zero is called indeterminate form. Same thing for infinity minus infinity means we cannot determine the exact value for these two, either the fraction or the difference. Because each infinity here stands for a different, a huge number. So there's no exact value, it's not zero. And 0 over 0 is not 1. We don't have a value for this. So when we are doing the limits or finding limits, and then we got a 0 over 0 or infinity minus infinity, then we have to find a way to get rid of these forms, to, to actually get an actual value. And how do we do so? Well, we have tricks. There are about four tricks. Either rationalizing, expanding, factoring or combining fractions. Any questions so far? If no questions, we can move on and look at the next problem. Example, limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. So if we pass the limit on the top over the limit on the bottom, and then you go through the process as we did before, step by step. Limit of the difference is the difference of the limits for both. You get the limit inside the parentheses, square it, and everything else stays the same, and we got zero over zero, which is indeterminate, with those sad faces, right? So that's not an answer. So what we have to do, one of the tricks 
So you must show that you got zero over zero first. And then we can move on and factor the top as x minus one times x plus one over x minus one. The x minus one cancel each other. Then we're just finding the limit for x plus one. From there on, you don't have to show step by step, like because you showed all the steps in the first part to, to show or to confirm the zero over zero form, you don't have to do it in the later stuff here. So you got a two. Graphically, what's going to happen on the graph? If you look at this function x squared minus 1 over x minus 1, notice you can cancel the x minus 1 and that will give you just a straight line x plus 1. Do you see that? Just y equals x plus 1. And that x plus 1, we may graph it. We may graph it. It's a straight line. The only thing at x equals 1, there's a hole. Do you see that hole in green? Because we canceled the x minus 1. There's a hole there at x equals 1. So what this is saying, when we try to find the limit as x approaches 1, the y value was approaching 2. That's what this is saying. So it's not when x equals 1, y2, no. When x was approaching to 1, y was approaching on the y value to 2. So if you look on the x-axis and you see the green arrows, that means when we approach one from both sides, then the y value from the top and the bottom are approaching the value two. That's what it is. Next example, limit as h goes to 0 of 4 plus h squared minus 16 over h. Try this one. So let's look at this one. If you go through step by step, you will get 0 over 0. But don't do that on the test. You write three dots as I did. So one way to do this, I tried to use expanding. So I expanded the first one using the a plus b squared formula from the, the journey to calculus packet. And then I got 16 plus 8h plus h squared minus 16. So the 16 cancels out. Don't cancel h with h as I circled them out with those colorful stuff. But instead you need to factor the h out and cancel them out. After you pass the limit, you get 8. On the right hand side, I showed you that that's the right way to do it. If it's multiplication, you can cancel, but addition or subtraction, you can't. For the next one, Limit as x approaches 0 plus 1 over x minus 1 over x plus x squared. How do you do this? You find the limit of the first one minus the limit of the second one. Now, how am I going to find the limit of the first one? It's 1 over 0. It's actually 0 plus means you're approaching 0 from the right side. Every time you find the limit and x goes to 0 or 0 plus, you need to check out, you need to check out how is the graph behaving as x approaches 
zero from the right side. And same thing for the other function, one over x plus x squared. To do so, you graph each one of them. So I grab the first one, and I notice as I approach from the right side, the graph is going up to positive infinity. And I graph the next one, and I notice the same thing. X goes to positive infinity. So I got infinity minus infinity. And this is indeterminate form. Not zero, that's indeterminate. We cannot determine the value of it. Now, to do so, we combine the fractions to get to this form. So what I did, I combined the fractions by finding their LCD, which is x times 1 plus x. And then the numerator, what happens, the 1 minus 1 cancel each other, and hence the axes cancel each other. So now all I got is to find the limit as x approaches 0 plus of 1 over 1 plus x, which is 1. One over one plus zero. Next one, if you are able to see it, the limit as x approaches one of x minus one over the square root of x minus one. So if you try to find the limit of that and go through this step by step, what do we get? Okay, what do we get for that? We're gonna get zero over zero, right? Zero over zero. So what do we need to do here? we can rationalize by multiplying top and bottom by the conjugate. So when you multiply by the conjugate, that's what we learned in the calculus packets that we learned review to from for the calculus, is you multiply top and bottom by the conjugate, is which is the square root of x plus 1. Now top stays the same. The bottom is a difference of squares. The square root of the first one minus one square and that would give us x minus one in the denominator they will cancel each other then as x approaches one you get one plus one which is two And we will finish the rest next time.